the AWS Financial Services Symposium, presented by The Cube. Good afternoon, AWS fans, and welcome back to New York City. We are here at the AWS Financial Services Symposium. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching The Cube. But more importantly, I am very excited to be joined by Chris Brown this morning. Chris, what's up? How are you doing? You're going to share some secrets. Doing great. <laughs> Good. So I was really excited about our talk. You're, you're going to be telling us about securing data for major banks, which I can imagine is both regulated, complicated, and we're talking about a volume of data. But before we even get into that, you've been doing this for a long time. Data security is your jam. Yeah, data security has been something I've been doing for a really long time, actually. I mean, really kind of got big into it um, during the Hadoop era, which yeah. I know is like dead and gone now. Everyone's moved over to AWS and Databricks, Snowflake or whatever. Um, but, you know, really cut my teeth in this area, um, really in, I know it's a financial um symposium, but in the Department of Defense and uh, intelligence agencies, right? So keeping all that data, you know, contained that, you know, can't leak out and things like that is still very relevant to what we're doing here. So, yeah, I mean, I guess if you've been handling matters of national security and then you're dealing with banks, it's, it's <laughs> but it's, it's a similar level of, of compliance. It's a similar level of intensity. So how, how do you approach? I mean, we have so much data now. We've never had more data. We're, yeah. we're only going to be making more data. How do you approach data security at scale like you're doing for banks? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting how you do this. I mean, typically what we've done in the past is we basically created these basically proxy patterns back into our data systems, right? And the problems with those is that you know, as people go through there, you have to scale those systems out. Then you have the problem of actually scaling out your data platform all at the same time. Right. And doing that is a massive chore and something that no, no one wants to do. And so what's unique that we've done at Muta is that we've actually integrated into those data platforms. So now what we do is we become like the policy authoring and the policy decision points. And we push those decisions down into those compute platforms where they become the policy enforcement point, which is great because everyone wants to do these self-service analytics. Right. So now we're actually giving people the true power to be able to bring in whatever business intelligence tool they want, run whatever model they want. They can all access that compute platform, mm -hmm. right? Because those policies are going to be enacted there before data even leaves the system. And they're going to be done consistently throughout the system. That's pretty amazing. I never had thought about policy in the stack as a as a part of the compute yeah is this a new part of where we're at with data governance is this how it's always been that's kind of fascinating yeah i mean i mean that is where we're starting to see things go i mean you look at what yeah. databricks is doing today with unity catalog mm -hmm. right they're starting to build in these row and column um, filters and so snowflake has that we're starting to see a lot of this coming to fruition with um aws and redshift they're starting to build those things in so it's going to get even more relevant with uh, lake formation and things like that um and it really is about like if you're kind of having those policies external to the compute platform you're always going to be stuck with this like impedance be able to you know give people the power to utilize the compute platforms how they're supposed to because they're built to scale right Databricks, Snowflake, Redshift, they are scalable platforms. You don't even have to think about it, right? And that's what we need. And allow those people to come into the systems with their own tools, right? Again, it gets back to that self-service analytical use cases, the democratization of data. Mm -hmm. If people have to continually learn new tools, new ways to do things, your infrastructure team has to be able to consistently um, create the policies, get them deployed at scale. That just slows everything down. And this is all about speeding up the access to data. What does is, what is having access faster mean for customers or for consumers? It means something other? different to, to everyone. Yeah. Because, right? you know, like a lot of times it might be um, being able to give better customer service, right? So we're getting information in about like, you know, you look at fraud. Mm -hmm. Like that's a big thing, right? And, um, you know, there's like the chase commercial to where one of the things that the person sees, there's alert coming through, like, did you actually make this payment? Yes, no, they can stop their car, right? And that's all about doing real-time analytics and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that's giving better customer service. It might be focused on being able to um, get into a market better, be able to find a niche space um, because you're able to do better analytics to be able to Im improve profitability, um, whatever it might be, right? So it really depends upon like the actual use case and what you're trying to accomplish that is going to, um, you know, utilizing that data is going to give you the edge somehow, whether it's something like, you know, customer service or just, you know, being able to improve business efficiencies. 
Yeah. So, wow. Okay. So it really does mean a lot of different things. And I am a Chase customer who gets those notifications. <laughs> yeah. And especially as a traveler, it's really nice when it knows that I'm just on the road versus thinking somebody stole my card. And financial services industry, one of the most regulated, heavy yeah. compliance zones on the planet, really, and, and in the whole world. How do you navigate balancing those laws, all of this data at scale? I mean, beyond being inside the stack and at the compute level, there's got to be new stuff happening, especially with AI. How do you stay up to date and make sure that that's reflected yeah, that's, in the product? That, that is like so hard to do these it's days. Gotta be, right? I mean, yeah. Because like, I mean, it's funny because like, um, you know, again, regulations like GDPR mm-hmm. in um, Europe. There's um, CCPA in California. C- CPA. Um, I live in Virginia, so Virginia has their own now. So we're going to see like 50 states. Who knows when the federal government's going to do it here? There are different ra- laws and regulations in Asia and stuff like that. Yeah. So it is a continual battle to be able to try to figure out like, you know, how do you actually um, comply to all these regulations and stuff like that. And what is good is with our platform is that like we take the very simple building blocks, right? Being able to just do basic things like column masking, like making sure people can't access anything in this column, um, row filtering, like that's probably one of our number one use cases within financial uh, industry is that I'm only able to see information in North America versus information in um, Europe, right. or maybe it's just Germany or this eight region over here. So we're able to filter all that data out for you. One of the other things that's really unique that we do um, is this concept of a purpose-based control. And it really gives context to how people are supposed to use the data. I actually dumb it down and basically into, it's like a data use agreement, right? Good. What can you do with the data? What can't you do with the data? Which starts to become even more important um, within, um, you know, these machine learning use cases. Yeah. Um, because like, you know, we're talking about, uh, they had a session earlier today around responsible AI, right? So you want to be able to automate and make sure that your data scientists are operating underneath these purpose statements saying, I'm going to do responsible AI. So they're talking about, you know, the traditional problem of, um, you know, like demographic bias within mortgage lending, right? So 100%. great. Yeah. So like what we can do is we can do feature blinding, make sure those demographic things are normally not available to the data scientist. But if they're working underneath like this ethical AI purpose data use agreement, maybe those things get opened up to them because now they can run and they have to share things like their Google model card with metrics about did this model, like, is it really more accurate with the demographics versus without, you know, can you show that this is actually a fair model using metrics yeah. there and things like that? Um, you know, and then it gets even, you know, more complicated with LLMs these days and trying to get, get into that space. So, which is where we're starting to actually, um, uh, start to make some plain plays into, um, we're out at the snowflake conference also there where snowflake announced basically their generative AI capabilities. Databricks will be announcing theirs next week. Uh, yeah, we'll all be that. There. Yeah, well, I'll be yeah. there too. Oh, <laughs> so, <great. laughs> um, so we've we started integrating into those platforms, um, being able to do rad use cases. Mm-hmm. So making sure that um, you know, as users go in and they start trying to ask questions of the generative AI system that they only get back relevant um, kind of snippets, chunks, summaries of the data that they're able to see. So making sure that things that are confidential maybe versus public. So if I'm able to see confidential data, I might get a lot more information that can right. be someone who can only see public data. So we're starting to build into those models very early days, right? That's with a complex, lot of those things. Though. Yeah, it's, it, but it's, it's really exciting because, you know, there's a lot of really interesting things with um, generative AI and um, uh, in, um, in the LLMs today. And, you know, let's be honest, most people are not going to be building their new fi- foundational models. I mean, that's going to be left to the metas, the Googles, AWS, the people who have the money to actually be able to do that. So where people are going to be focusing in on right now are those RAG use cases, because mm-hmm. we got to stop the hallucination. We got to make sure that things are relevant to the people. And then there's fine tuning, right? And with fine tuning, like I've done some fine tuning um, back probably three, four years ago with a, um, when I was working in consulting, um, it was in a healthcare um, use case, um, you know, looking at med- medical notes, but yeah. I was using Google's BERT, right? I mean, yeah. that's like early days of this kind of thing. Um, but that was still very expensive and very hard to do. Yeah. Um, and so using RAG, it seems to be kind of like the lightweight way, cheap way, relatively easy way for people to be able to use these models but be able to stop a lot of the problems that occur with them. Yeah. So 
Were you expecting, I feel like you're in a really unique position, plus you've been a consultant for a long time. Were you expecting this crazy boom that we've seen in the last year and a half? No. I mean, like, it was interesting because, like, um, about five years ago, I started kind of seeing, um, you know, when we're talking about really more of the um, deep learning models and some of the, you know, changes that were going there. But you started seeing, like, more real-world use cases come up, and they were actually working, right? Because, you know, I joke with people is that, like, you know, I was, I did computer science in, um, you know, I say last century, right? I graduated oh college God. 96. When you put it like that, I know. it really <laughs> makes me feel archaic. Exactly. Jeez. I like to, you know, I have to embrace that I've gotten last older, right? <laughs> like literally last century. I'm going to be chewing on that for the rest of the day. Thank you for that, Chris. I really appreciate that. Actually. I try. Yeah. But I mean, my professors, they were already in doing these AI things, yeah. right? And it was still like this very scientific thing. And then um, I was doing some work within telecom, doing fraud within telecom. And we actually, I actually played with, and it's laughable today, um, a single layer back propagation network as a neural network, right? And Love now you it. look at like what you have today. Yeah. And it was like, oh, that was interesting, but it couldn't really do much. Right. And so like you kept seeing, it's like, okay, there's something there, but you still have to keep advancing. I think with like what AWS brought, um, you know, really when I started getting into it, like 2010s of cloud computing. So making it kind of scalable compute, kind of easy to scale all these things out. That started helping build the bridge to where we could actually build out these larger models, get to real use cases with um, AI ML. Um, and then obviously, you know, as the advancements came, we have seen the explosion with um, chat GPT-4. Yeah. I mean, and what's funny is people think like GPT-4 like if they don't know, they think that's the first thing. But yeah. there's been other versions of it yeah. that, you know, if you've been following, you know how long those advancements and how tough it's been for them to get to where they were with four, which really kind of set off the explosion that we're seeing. I know. It's just been wild. It's a wild time to be in our world right Yeah, it now. is. And it's really fun. There's some impressive stats in my notes here. So you've been able to scale secure data and roll it out to 6,000 analysts in just six months, automating 95% of data access requests and achieving 100% audible compliance. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's impressive. Yeah, that's the beauty. So, like, you know, what's great about Amuto and really the reason why, you know, like I said, I was in the consulting world before, you know, because I keep flip-flopping between products and consulting. So I was in the consulting world, like looking at these problems, trying to do these problems, especially with uh, open source tools. Yeah. Um, and so when I saw Amuta and, you know, knew some people who went over there, what really impressed me was the way that they were able to utilize true attribute-based access control. And that is really kind of, you know, three, you know, a couple of, two different things that you have to have. One, you have to have attributes about users mm -hmm. and you have to have attributes about the data. Right? Yeah. A lot of times you'll see people doing, hey, we do attribute-based access control, but they're missing attributes about users. Like they have the attributes about the data because they have the tags and things like that, but they're missing the very specific things about the users. They have users in roles still rather than, hey, I'm part of this department. Hey, I'm able to see these country codes, right? And be able to do that enforcement using true attribute-based access control at runtime is what's key. And the other thing that's really unique about Immuta is that it really changes who creates the policies. Because when you look at organizations today, you have data stewards who, let's be honest, typically are not technical, mm -hmm. right? They know the policy, they know what should happen, but they can't go into a system and write the SQL to be able to you know, create views or write these like um, column filters that you can do in like Databricks or Snowflake or something like that. And so they need a very simple interface to be able to enforce those things, enforce them consistently, because typically they have to get a DBA. Yeah. So Amuta gives them an interface that is plain English. Like, you know, when I do demos, I'm like, hey, anyone here on this phone, whether you're technical or not, you can read this and you can tell me exactly what's going to happen, right? And so they are That's now- That's important. Yes, it's key, right? Yeah. So, and, and it makes it understandable, right? Because anyone, hey, we need to audit this. Where's this right, policy? Right, exactly. Someone can read, the lawyer can read, this is what the policy is. And what's great is we continually monitor your data environment. We bring those data sources in. So as new data sets are made, we're able to bring that in and automatically apply those policies. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have to, every time you, know, you want to create a new table, get the DBA done, do the, you know, and enforce policies, do the testing, do this, which delays access to data. 
And even more importantly is the fact that like we do that across multiple platforms. Like we can do it again across Redshift. We can actually get into S3 from, from AWS. Got to make sure I mention those guys, right? Um, Databricks, Snowflake, and others. So I can write one policy that can go across all three of those different four, you know, all the platforms that we support and do it automatically. So I don't have to get someone for Databricks. I don't have to get someone to create IAM policies for S3. I don't have to get someone for Redshift to be able to do all this stuff. And it makes it very easy to manage that. And that's how you're able to actually, um, you know, do all that um, enforcement of policy across all those users, yeah. across around the world, different departments, um, sometimes internal and external users, and across like the thousands of data sources that people have because there's constantly being, um, you know, created and updated every day. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time awesome. this morning. We've been happy to be here. It's been great. Yeah. And thank all of you for tuning in to our fantastic coverage here in New York City at AWS Financial Services Symposium. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news.